Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. Canadian football was born in the mid-1800s, a child of rugby reshaped by robust young men off on a new world adventure. The version they devised, rougher, tougher, and bloodier, found a home on university athletic fields where the student body became the game's first fans. But this wonderful new game was strictly a Canadian phenomenon until a fateful weekend in 1874 when the men of McGill University accepted an invitation to play two matches at Harvard and found the Americans playing a different game entirely, an offshoot of soccer containing little of the rough and tumble chaos now so dear to the Canadians' hearts. They played one game under the Canadian rules, under McGill's rules, one game under the uh, Harvard rules, in the end, Harvard enjoyed the type of football that McGill brought so much that they rode away to rugby school in England and they got the official rugby rules. The game of the North was now a cross-border phenomenon. Soon, it spilled over the campuses and into the cities, then west with the settlers. No longer merely the sport of the educated elite, it became the game of the working masses. Teams sprang out of meetings held in rooms over grocery stores, in mechanics halls and rowing clubs. Bankers bashed iron workers. Lawyers took their lumps from lumberjacks. Leagues were born, collapsed, and rose again. A new country had a new game and new heroes. By the turn of the century, football had been embraced by athletes of all ages and from all walks of life, competing for trophies of every shape and size. In 1909, word of this new game caught the attention of Albert Henry George Gray, the fourth Earl Gray and the Governor General of Canada. Well-known patrons of Canadian arts, the Earl and his wife decided that the new game should have a true national championship. At a cost of $48, Lord Grey provided a simple silver trophy that would one day be the stuff of dreams, the Grey Cup. The cup was donated by uh, the Governor General, uh, Lord Earl Grey, who probably never saw a game played. Uh, he put up the trophy for the Amateur Football Championship of Canada, and people who were playing football in all parts of Canada saw it as emblematic of the national championship. The first Grey Cup game was held on a chilly December Saturday in 1909. 3,800 fans made the trek to Rosedale Field to watch the University of Toronto defeat the Parkdale Canoe Club in what was rather grandly called the Canadian Championship. But Lord Grey's trophy wasn't there. Someone had forgotten to have it engraved. The games then were simple gatherings young and not-so-young athletes out for a rough-and-tumble afternoon. 
But soon, Earl Grey's Cup was more than just another trophy. As the decades passed and the number of challengers grew, it would become the new game's Holy Grail. In the 1940s, not even a world in conflict could halt the yearly quest. When Canada went to war, enlisted men formed teams and battled for the cup under military banners. Through rain, fog, mud, or the chill of Canadian winter, the cup chase never faltered. Now, the pursuers wanted more than the championship. They wanted that magical, matchless moment when they could grasp Earl Grey's cup and triumphantly hold it high. When you win the Grey Cup, you know, you're, you're on such a high because you've accomplished what nine teams start out to do and only one does. What it meant to the city of Winnipeg and the fans, uh, that's when it starts sinking in uh, of just how important the Grey Cup is and what it means to the people of Canada. It really didn't hit you till a few days later and you, you know, when you get back at Edmonton and you're going to the parade and say, hey, this is kind of a big deal. The city of Vancouver, on our uh, return, just opened their arms to us. A marvelous thing and very special. There was love here for the BC Lions. 20 below weather, the streets were lined all the way from the airport entrance to City Hall, where they took us back to on buses, and the town just went nuts. Every team sets out, and you want to win the championship. Win the championship. That is a successful season. Anything else isn't successful. It didn't really hit me at the, after the game. It hit me the next year, seeing that this trophy is going to be forever. Your name's going to be a part of it, and you're going to be associated with a great cup winning team. Canadian football's eastern roots gave this rugged game at least a touch of refinement. Out west, settlers toughened by hardship and prairie winters reveled in their own bone-crushing version, fought with a ferocity and abandon that turned a simple game into a no-quarter battle. They just threw money into the pot, and the first one that drew blood uh, got the money. Uh, there were a lot of broken bones and uh, broken noses and front teeth missing and that kind of thing. In the uh, first game, Regina played against Saskatoon. Up in Saskatoon, the uh, police chief was so upset with the fact that the uh, Regina team was winning and he thought they were playing too rough against the Saskatoon boys that he came on the field and had the Regina team arrested. In spite of the potential for injury or arrest, football thrived on the Canadian prairie. The Hamilton Tigers became the first team to journey west, playing exhibition games in Winnipeg, Moose Jaw, Regina, and Calgary. While Eastern teams were happy to share the game with the West, sharing their championship trophy was another matter. Only Eastern teams were, would play for the Grey Cup. And in 1911, the Calgary Tigers won the, the championship of the West, and they challenged. They wanted to play in the Grey Cup. And the CRU wouldn't let them. They, they would first turn them down. They said, you didn't play in the East, you, you can't play challenge for the Grey Cup. Finally, with great reluctance, the Edmonton Eskimos were allowed to come east in 1921 to challenge Toronto for the right to sip from the Earl's silvered mug. Their timing couldn't have been worse. They ran head on to the man known as the big train, Lionel Conacher. They ended up losing 23 to nothing in that game. Conacher, as a matter of fact, uh, scored 15 points and uh, halfway through the third quarter had to leave because he had a hockey game that night. Hockey and football were just two of the many sports on the Conica resume. All played so brilliantly that he was named Canada's athlete of the half century. Since 1921, Western teams had marched east for the Grey Cup game, only to fall to the Eastern football powerhouses. In desperation, they cast their eyes not to the heavens, but to the south. 
we didn't have the population in the West that uh, they had in the East, so in order to get enough guys, uh, you know, it was, uh, we had to supplement them with uh, good, uh, experienced American players from American colleges. And, uh, of course, the first su most successful of those teams was the Winnipeg team in 1935. Winnipeg coach Joe Ryan took a fishing trip to Minnesota and North Dakota that fateful summer of 1935. His bait, money, and he landed his limit. For $7,400, he came home with nine imports, including the West's first superstar, the incomparable Fritzy Hansen. With Fritzy carrying the mail, the Bombers romped through the West and into the Grey Cup game, where, on a muddy field in Hamilton, stunned Easterners got their first look at the little big man from Minnesota. Fritzy Hansen was an import that, for Winnipeg, and he was one of these scatbacks that could dangle. And he caught a couple of kicks and ran right through the whole team because nobody had any traction. He had the whole field to himself, and he made the game look easy for Winnipeg, and he made a great name for himself. In Fritzy and Friends, the Canadian Rugby Union did not see players of great skill. They saw a threat to the very game itself, with teams buying championships and Americans shoving local boys off the roster. Their solution changed the rules. The CRU decided that uh, they didn't want these American imports coming in uh, specifically to win a competition. So they passed what was called a, a one-year residency rule. And they said that any American playing in the Grey Cup game had to be in the country for at least one year prior to the game. American imports were now a fact of Canadian football life. Although their numbers increased with the years, they did not destroy the game as the CRU had so darkly predicted. They enhanced it. The Northern League thrived, an alliance that continues to bring great American players to a game that remains distinctly Canadian. There's something about the Canadian Football League in Canada. It's got a tremendous uh, history about it when you go back and look at some of the great people that have come up here and lived in this country and they got the opportunity to play. I mean, this is what the game's all about. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I wanted to come play. And in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. During the Depression, there was seldom a penny to spare for children's games. But kids who longed to play football could always find a way. Nobody had a football, so we'd take somebody's cap, you know the old caps that the kids used to wear, you'll see them in pictures, and stuff it with uh, padding, and we, so we have no kicking game, so it's a running game only. And uh, that's how we got started. All our footballs were homemade. We couldn't afford a football. Well, I had some made like a football, made out of a sack or some stuff, sack or a pig's bladder or something like that. But the only time that I ever touched a real football is when I went to uh, high school. But young boys become young men, and there are real footballs to be thrown and real games to be played. As a pastime becomes a passion, a game becomes a way of life. Though the stakes grow higher and the wins more important, it all comes down to a simple love of the game. Canadian football was plain, old-fashioned mayhem. You played it, in my day, you played it because you loved the game. The players didn't make any money, they, uh, and so they all held jobs. Stukas worked for the star. And uh, as a football writer, while well, at the time he was playing, which he certainly gave himself the benefit of the doubt in his stories, 
Stukas tells the story of playing for the Argonauts when they won the Grey Cup, I think it was 1938, and uh, all he got for it was a windbreaker. Uh, he says a really nice windbreaker. Though the players weren't making any money, they could see by the crowds paying their way into the parks that someone was. They decided it was time they got a piece of the pie. The man the Toronto Argonauts picked to plead their case, Annis Stukas. Management was quick to respond. How dare this goddamn football player ask for money? We let him play. We give him great uniforms. We go to the best hotels when we go out of towns. Holy mackerel, and now the guy wants money? Playing football in Canada was an uncertain profession at best, but the harsh Canadian winter was a virtual guarantee. Uh, I used to die in the cold uh, because you have the lighter uniforms on, so every time you hit the ground, you took a chunk out of your hide. You literally did take a chunk out of your body. And the, the, the most painful thing I had to do that day was take a shower. It was so painful to, to get in that water. In our first game, the referee had to stand under the goalpost. It was snowing so hard to see if the ball was going through on field goals and extra points. And I said, what did I get myself into here? I'm cold. Football was a daylight game. If dusk fell before the final gun, finishing the contest required a little help from the crowd. Fans were urged to park their cars along the sidelines because if the game got going too long, then uh, what would happen was that they'd turn the lights on and, from their cars and, uh, and, and play it out that particular way. We were playing a game in Ottawa, and we played the last 10 minutes of that game or five minutes of that game uh, under headlights. They, they got the people to turn their headlights on in the cars. And that's how we finished the game. By the 1930s, football had been in Canada for better than a half century, and still the game looked a lot like rugby. The forward pass had found its way into the rule book, but not everyone cared or dared to use it. The kicking was the essence of the game. What the guys did is that they punted the ball and then ran down underneath it. As the forward pass came in, in 19, around 1930, there were different rules. For example, if a pass was incomplete, it was a fumble. And so uh, it was used very judiciously. The man who changed all that was Warren Stevens. In 1931, he threw the Grey Cup's first touchdown pass in Montreal's 22-0 win over Regina. But change requires time. While the forward pass could be a quick and devastating weapon when successful, throwing the ball was still no simple matter. To be honest with you, we, we didn't throw that many passes as, as they do today. The, the darn balls, they were almost like, almost like a soccer ball. It was very difficult to, to grab a hold of the darn thing, so you just you laid it on the palm of your hand and threw it. In other words, you didn't grip it. Well, the ball we used was relatively primitive because it wasn't dimpled to enable the quarterback to grasp it easier. And when I look at it, I, you know, I can't believe the, the size and the shape compared to how it is today. Pass, run, or kick, the name of the game was hitting, and the padding offered little protection. The equipment I used, uh, people would laugh at. What you got when you went up with the big team was secondhand furniture. The training camp, the, the new guys coming in took old timers equipment from a year, two years past. And if the shoes were a size too big, Tough luck, wear them. The post-war years were a boom time for Canadian football. In 1948, the
The Calgary Stampeders galloped through the three-team West as they recorded the only undefeated season in league history. Heading east, the four-day train trip became a traveling party as the Stampeders made the cross-country trek to the Grey Cup game. Arriving with Stetson Top fans, Indian Chiefs, chuck wagons, and horses, the Stampeders didn't just come from the West, they brought the West with them. The 1948 Great Cup game was pivotal in uh, turning a celebration into a national festival. The Calgary Stampeders brought their chuck wagons, loaded them on the train, uh, they had flapjack breakfast, they had horses parading through hotel lobbies. It gave it another dimension and uh, from that time on I think almost every Great Cup game has been measured by what happened in 1948. The Stampeders did more than defeat the Ottawa Rough Riders 12-7. Their victory and their fans' western exuberance turned a three-hour showdown into a week-long hoedown, and the party has never stopped. Grey Cup Day has become Grey Cup Week, a game once of regional interest is now a national obsession. And so, the story of the modern-day CFL begins. It is the story of a league often battered but never down of a game that is an important thread in the Canadian cultural fabric, a game that is ours and ours alone. Canadian football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball, and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. The excitement in the game in a Canadian football game with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return. It may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one. Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart an annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion.
Canadian football in Saskatchewan began in 1910 with the formation of the Regina Rugby Club. 14 years later, the team became known as the Rough Riders. While Regina made seven Grey Cup appearances, victory eluded them. In 1948, they became the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, the team of the entire province. Three years later, they found their first superstar, quarterback Glenn Dobbs. The entire community just went absolutely nuts over this uh, distinguished looking uh, tall Oklahoman. And he told me that he loved the people, loved going fishing with them, and the people of Saskatchewan and Regina were, were just family the way they were in Oklahoma. In 1951, Dobbs led Saskatchewan into the Grey Cup against Ottawa. But that day, it was the Eastern Riders who left the field champions. In 56, tragedy struck Saskatchewan. A plane crash claimed the lives of four players returning from an all-star game. In 1963, the arrival of Washington State fullback George Reed marked a new beginning for the Rough Riders. There were several teams in the States that wanted me to come in as a free agent. I guess, and, and try with them. And I was weighing some offers. And then I got this call about coming to Canada to play football. The deciding factor was basically money. I was out offered $1,000 more in the contract. And, you know, at the time I was married, uh, had a young kid. So I was looking for all the money I could get. Reed recommended a former Washington State teammate who'd been trying his luck with the San Francisco 49ers, Hugh Campbell. In geography, I had studied that there was a Saskatchewan. I'm, I don't think I had heard of Regina. And, uh, it, you know, I'd, I had to look at a map again to make sure of where I was going. And when I saw the uh, stadium in Regina, it looked like a farmer had built it, you know, like they'd just added on a few pieces here and there. And half of the dressing room was dirt floor, which where us rookies got to be was down there. But, you know, we had a hook for everybody to hang their clothes on, so that was a pretty good deal. That season, a trade with Ottawa brought Saskatchewan a new quarterback. At first glance, Coach Bob Shaw felt he got less than he bargained for. I go bang on the door, and this booming voice says, Come in. I go in, and this guy says, uh, Can I help you? I said, I'm looking for uh, Coach Shaw. He says, I'm uh, Coach Shaw. Who are you? I said, Well, my name's Lancaster. And he goes, Who? I said, Ron Lancaster. He goes, you got to be kidding me. you got to be bigger than that. He says, wait outside. I'll talk to you later. And that was my first introduction to Saskatchewan. Having spent three seasons in Ottawa, Lancaster brought experience and leadership to the Rough Rider offense and a take-charge style that earned him the nickname, the Little General. The first time I stepped into a huddle where Ron Lancaster was the quarterback, uh, I gave him the benefit of the doubt, but I have to admit, I was a bit curious how this would all work out. He seemed quite nervous in the huddle, but then right away, we started completing passes. In the huddle, a lot of people talked and so forth, but he was the, I guess you called him the commander in chief in there, and he would let you know it if you got out of line. And is that, this is my huddle, this is where we're gonna do things, now let, let's go out and get it done. Any quarterback has to have two things. Somebody to hand the ball to when he needs yardage. And it didn't matter how tough the situation was, we knew George could get the yardage. And the other one is when you're in trouble, you have to have one pass receiver or somebody on that club that you feel confident with, that you consider your go-to person. Hugh Campbell, it got to the point where I could tell where he was going by the way he was running. And when you have people like George and Hugh, you're naturally going to go to them in key situations. The riders boasted a balance of skill and toughness, and none were tougher than a local farm boy who terrorized the opposition, Ron Atchison. There's no such thing as an easy game. You know, you're fighting for your life all the time, and the, you, may, you may beat a team uh, on the scoreboard, but they may beat the hang out of you on the field. So I never looked at anybody as an easy game. I always went prepared to fight for your life sort of thing. In the 1963 playoffs, the Rough Riders suffered a 35-9 loss to Calgary in the first of a two-game total point series. Heading into game two at Taylor Field, Saskatchewan fans had given up all hope of victory. Very few people came to the game because it was very cold, but they listened to it on the radio. 
And by the end of the first quarter, the stands were full. People were coming, they, hey, something's going on, and they came to this game, and so that even jacked us up more. We came out for the third quarter, the place was packed. And then from then on, it was one of those games where uh, it was hanging in the balance because they had four opportunities to kick field goals from within 30 yards to ice that thing, and they could, they missed them. And for some reason or other, we got momentum, they couldn't get it back. The Riders won the game by 27, and the series by a single point, in a comeback victory that became known as the little miracle of Taylor Field. Well, this city went absolutely delirious. There was people spilling out into the streets, there was parties. You'd have thought they'd won the Grey Cup game. It was the kind of victory that just sent this town into a, to a frenzy of, of just absolute happiness, and it ensured Lancaster of, of a place here for the rest of his life. The 1964 season was the last for coach Bob Shaw, the new man in charge of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, the sage of Turkey Neck Bend, Kentucky, Eagle Keys. Eagle Keys came as a head coach in 1965, and he was such a down-to-earth guy that he and Ronnie hit it off right away. And uh, he let Ronnie run the offense pretty well. The best thing about Eagle Keys was when he took over the football club, he didn't try to rebuild it. You know, they had put a, together a pretty good nucleus of a football team, and he just came in and tweaked it. And that football team was pretty solid for the next seven years. With the Eagle, you always knew where you stood. He always laid the rules out very good for you, and if you followed his rules and so forth, uh, then you're okay. We just built a relationship that uh, we could get things done, and he made us all feel that individually you're not very good, but together you guys can be a pretty good football team if you play together. We were a stronger offensive team than we were a, a defensive team. I mean, sure, we always tried to improve our defensive uh, club, but I was always the offensive coordinator, so <laughs> that's what I'm thinking more of uh, offense than I am defense. Under Coach Key's offensive system, George Reed became the CFL's top running back and was named the league's outstanding player for 1965. The following year, the arrival of Ed McQuarters added strength and speed to the rider defense. That season, Saskatchewan made their first Grey Cup trip in 15 years, prompting a rare speech from Coach Keyes. He said, uh, going to the Grey Cup can be good or it can be terrible. To go to the Grey Cup and not win it, he says, you'll always feel bad the rest of your life. And uh, I know he was right because if you don't win the Grey Cup, then the season is kind of for nothing. You want it, you want that cup. That, that's what you think about from your first game, is you want to you win the Grey Cup. At Vancouver's Empire Stadium, the Western Riders got a warm welcome from the enthusiastic crowd. Ottawa jumped to an early lead, but Saskatchewan's little general stuck to the game plan. For us to beat Ottawa that day, we needed to get a running game going, control the football game, uh, throw if we had to, but let's utilize our running game and keep their offense off the field and wear their defense down. We felt going in that if we could be close at halftime, we would win the second half. And that's just about exactly what happened. Ryan Lancaster just kind of said, hey, okay, it's time for us to start playing now. And we got down and, and we started fighting our way back. And I guess the, I guess that when I broke the, I think it was a 32 yard run for the clinching touchdown, I guess it was the greatest feeling in the world because we knew that we had won the game. I can still see George Reed on the last touchdown that we scored breaking up the middle, he hit that hole, and no one touched him, and he went in from like 25, 30 yards out. The game was ours right there, it was over. A 29-14 victory over Ottawa brought the Riders the Grey Cup. At long last, Saskatchewan fans had cause to celebrate, and Rider pride swept the province. It was just something that we couldn't believe. We had won the Grey Cup for Saskatchewan for the first time, and it was just a, just a tremendous feeling. We thought we had really accomplished something. When we came back home, the streets were lined all the way from the airport entrance to City Hall, where they took us back to on buses, and the town just went nuts. That Grey Cup, it has never put that many miles on as it did that year in 1966, because it traveled to every town in Saskatchewan, and the people enjoyed it, whether it was after the game or in May. But they, they had the opportunity to see that Grey Cup, have the Grey Cup champions in their city, and it, it made it a great place to be. 
Saskatchewan returned to the Grey Cup the following season. Facing a Hamilton defense that hadn't given up a touchdown in five games, defending the Cup proved impossible. You automatically think you're going to win again next year. Well, lo and behold, we go to Ottawa to play the Hamilton Tiger Cats and almost get killed. Their defense dominated us, and uh, they deserved to win that football game, and they did 24 to 1. They won it very convincingly. I was hoping they'd play the last quarter in straight time because we could not move the football on that day. They shut us down pretty good. The 60s was a violent era for Canadian football. Players were always looking for an edge. Ron Atchison's was an injured arm that never seemed to heal. It just so happened to be his right forearm. And so he decided the only way he could get through was put a cast on this thing. And as games wore on, players on the other teams began to complain more and more and more. And Ron Atchison's cast was giving them concussions, was knocking them out, that he was, wasn't even trying to play football, he was just swinging this cast around. I think for the biggest majority of his career, this cast hung on a hook in his locker room, and before the game, he would lay his arm out and he'd fit this thing on it, and he'd just strap that thing up, and it was 14 pounds of dynamite, because anyone to come near him, he was gonna use it on him, and he didn't think twice about it, that's just the way he played. I didn't mind uh, if I hurt somebody. You don't hit them, they're going to hit you. You hit to, to so you can do your job. Like, if you don't stop someone's momentum, then you can't get your job done. 1968 saw the arrival of another win-at-all-costs player, a graduate of the Regina Rams junior football program, Bill the Undertaker Baker. When Bill Baker came to Saskatchewan Rough Rider after finishing university, we felt he was the most cocky, arrogant rookie that we had ever seen. We used to marvel at him. I was brought to Saskatchewan to be at the office of tackle, which I just, I'm not suited for, at least at that time. So I had a terrible time with office of tackle. I was just totally embarrassed. I was so embarrassed that I went and called Eagle Keys, the head coach, after the game on the phone. I said, Eagle, just so you know, I really was trying. <laughs> I said, but get me off that offense. But we'll tell you this, when it came time to put him on the defensive side of the ball, everyone knew he played defense. He's got that kind of nasty disposition. He clothesline you, then laugh, and uh, he, he enjoyed himself. He had fun in the locker room, but when you got on the field, man, he was tough. The tactics, the, the clotheslining and head slapping, and the clipping on the offensive side, the tactics of those days were, were pretty brutal in hindsight. Uh, I, I, I think if I, now, if I had to close somebody that, that way, I wouldn't do it. I'd be afraid to kill him. 1969, Saskatchewan captured the West and headed for another Grey Cup date with the Eastern Riders. The game was to be Ottawa quarterback Russ Jackson's farewell to football, and he arrived with guns blazing. It seems like every time we got to a Grey Cup game, something was going on. 1969 is going to be Russ Jackson's final game, and he put on a show. What hurt us there? A couple screen passes to a guy named Ronnie Stewart. I still remember the little uh, running back Stewart. He was so great that day that he's, he did more uh, winning the game than Russ Jackson did. I mean, he just ran through us like we weren't even there. Grey Cup losses haunted the Rough Riders. In 1972, a last second field goal gave Hamilton the victory. Facing Ottawa in 76, Saskatchewan held a four-point lead with less than a minute to play. But with Tom Clements and Tony Gabriel on the field, the game was far from over. We were at a house party, as I think the whole province was, everyone who wasn't attending the game, thought we had the game in the bag. And uh, all we yelled that last play was, watch Gabriel. Everyone at the house party was yelling, watch Gabriel, they're going to throw it at Gabriel. Clements is going to throw it at Tony Gabriel. Everybody in Canada, plus everybody in our bench, knew that he's going to Tony Gabriel. And we had a defense designed where we were supposed to double-team Gabriel coming off the line while we were in the wrong defense, and we couldn't get the double on him. So he gets off the line free, and he goes to the corner. That touchdown pass with a few seconds to go in the game, and that's something that uh, I know the people of Saskatchewan will ne never forget but uh, I know I'll never forget as well, because, uh, I mean, great play by a great player, and uh, he beat us. 
1976 was the last Grey Cup for Saskatchewan's Little General. Ron Lancaster would leave the game in 1978 after 16 seasons in the green and white. By 1987, Saskatchewan had gone 11 seasons without a playoff appearance. Rising costs and falling attendance had the Rough Riders on the verge of extinction. The team's directors called the undertaker, Bill Baker. We all understood that as the Rough Riders went, the CFL went. And by rejuvenating the Rough Riders and setting an example across the league, we would help rejuvenate the CFL. I'll never forget my meeting with Bill Baker. I walked in there and he said, he said, here's what I want to pay you. Here's what everybody else in the secondary makes. And if you don't like what I'm going to pay you, what I'm offering you, uh, you can play somewhere else. And it was that simple. I love the, the fact that he, he laid it on the line. He showed me where I was in the big picture, and I said, hey, well, hey, I can live with this. I don't like taking a pay cut, but I can live with it. With salaries in line, Baker's next move was a tug on the heartstrings telethon, and fans responded in true Saskatchewan style. I mean, you've got to see these telephones to believe them. They, they get a, a whole night of free airtime. Dewey Campbell came back from Edmonton. Uh, you know, Lancaster came in and so on. And they just get on that show and they'll get farmers sending in uh, tens of thousands of dollars to keep this team going. I remember uh, feeling the urgency of the telethon and feeling the fact that if we didn't raise enough money in this telethon, that this team would no longer exist, which is something that I just couldn't, you, you couldn't fathom living in, in that province. And Saskatchewan has, has always prided itself in being the best sort of fundraising. We, we may not have the best football team, but we always have the best fundraising. And that, and that really is the culture that Saskatchewan has. Bill Baker had instant credibility, so the fans responded to him. And I would say that he will always be remembered as another one in a long list of people uh, who have saved this franchise. As the 80s drew to a close, Ryder Pride returned to Taylor Field. Saskatchewan became a contender again as a new crop of stars took the team back to postseason play. In 1989, Saskatchewan advanced to the Western Final against the heavily favored Edmonton Eskimos. People were saying that the Edmonton Eskimos in 1989 were the best team the Canadian Football League had ever seen in its history. And we had no shot in that Western final. When we ended up winning that game and went back to Regina, the province finally had a team to cheer for uh, into the playoffs and, and a team that was going back to the Grey Cup, a place they hadn't been in a lot of years. When the veteran Riders squad took to the field in Toronto Skydome, the players knew that this could be their last chance at Grey Cup glory. It was one of those situations where you know, again, you kind of doubt yourself as far as, well, geez, everything, you know, going and we're not, we're not getting her done. We're not getting any younger. So if we're going to get an opportunity to do it, we better not mess up. I felt to myself, if I, if I blow this opportunity, I may never see this chance again. And I, and for me, it was watch as much film as I possibly could, stay in my regular routine and, and get ready for the biggest game of my life. The Hamilton Tiger Cats provided the opposition in one of the greatest Grey Cups ever. Tony Champion's spectacular catch tied the game with only 44 seconds to play, but the Riders weren't done yet. I have never seen a more confident group than the one that Ken Austin took on the field for that final drive. I, I had no doubt in my mind that we would be in field goal range. In fact, I remember walking over to Dave and said, get ready, because we're going to win this game in regulation. Coach Gregory called a timeout, and it seemed like we're trying to decide whether we should, uh, you know, possibly run another play before he made the kick. And then we decided, Ridgeway said, I want to make the kick now. Let's get it over with. And uh, Bob Pauley made a great snap. Uh, Glenn Suter put the ball down, and Ridge kicked her through, and the rest of us, you know, were just cheerleading, I guess. So it was a great feeling. As Ridgeway's last second field goal broke the tie, the entire province of Saskatchewan celebrated the Rough Riders' second Grey Cup championship. I was able to play as long as I did and finally get that opportunity to hold that Grey Cup. It was uh, a real special moment for myself and my teammates. I guess what they say is uh, the longer it takes, the sweeter it is, and it certainly was sweet for us. Everywhere we went, it was congratulations and 
thousands of people in Taylor Field to greet us in, in, the, in the snow blizzard and, and, uh, and see the Grey Cup in, in Taylor Field. And, and we had a chance to, to bring it back and hand it back to the province that deserved it because they'd wait a long time and, and, uh, and it, was, it was a great feeling to be able to give them, give them that Grey Cup. There was celebration after celebration throughout the province banquets and dinners, they had to bring the Grey Cup and everybody got to drink out of it and everybody got to hold it. And uh, they won that big one that year in, in a game that people I think still will talk about. And you, you will never find a more exciting football game than that one. Today, as new faces and new heroes fight to bring Saskatchewan Grey Cup glory, one thing remains true. Nothing is stronger than rider pride. I guess they always say there's only two seasons in Saskatchewan, that's football season and winter. So. Uh, it's one of those things where people just learn to love the Rough Riders and football. The feeling of the people in the province is, if you have a good year as a football team in Saskatchewan, it affects the whole province. When you look at the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and, and what they do in that province, uh, and what they mean to the people of the province, it's, it is unique to, to anything I've ever seen in, in all of sports. It's not just a team, it's not just a game. It's a way of life for them. If you have a good year as a football team in Saskatchewan, it affects the whole province. It makes the winners more bearable. The people are much more friendly. There's something about football in Saskatchewan that goes border to border, north, south, east, and west. They take a, a very active interest. It doesn't matter whether you want to sit at Coffee Row in January or June. You're going to discuss football in the CFL, and you're going to discuss the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. They knew all the names of the players. They, they knew where all of us lived. If you walk down the street, they were ready to talk to you, bump into them in the store. Uh, they knew which car was yours. If it was parked where it shouldn't be parked, you were in big trouble. The coaches and the players often say it's living in the fishbowl here, which is a good thing if they're winning, a bad thing if they're losing, because Don Matthews, who coached this football team, once said, I hate standing over looking at the cantaloupes in the store and having some lady ask me, why didn't you gamble on that third down play? And that's the way it is in Saskatchewan. I had never been anywhere where the topic of conversation 24 hours a day is football. It didn't matter where I went, whether it was to a restaurant, to a movie, just to the neighbors. They talk Saskatchewan Rough Rider football, and it does take a while to get used to. And the other thing is when you leave it, you miss it because, uh, you, you know, you, you sometimes wonder, if it, if, could you talk about something else, please? But when you, when you leave that situation, you really miss it because they care about the CFL and especially the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders training facilities, I, I thought were pretty good because anybody who grows up where I did, they look pretty good. But, but they were a bit of a joke because uh, we, we dressed above the old exhibition grounds. It was a little funny place with uh, not very good facilities. But then we had to run across the track to get to our playing field because we practiced inside the racetrack. And, and the big concern was that, that players were going get, to get killed by horses. And there almost were some players killed by horses running across the field. But we practiced out there, and it was a terrible practice field, just hard as a rock. It was really not a good place. But it was just kind of one of those fun things. And when you're 25, trying to race a horse across the track is, 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 good, is, is good fun. The danger was that you would uh, get hit by a horse when you were going to practice because they were always running around there, and, and the trotters were quite quiet. And a matter of fact, that's how my good friend Jack Goda met his wife, was she was riding a horse around the track and ran him over.
Eagle Keys uh, was probably, in my view, the greatest coach that ever coached here. And it wasn't necessarily uh, because of what he did on the field and so on. Uh, if you remember when Eagle became a head coach here, it was 1965. In 1963, uh, the Rough Riders had got Ron Lancaster out of Ottawa. Um, Ken Preston had made a trade for, I think, a bottle of scotch, he said. Lancaster and Russ Jackson were the two quarterbacks in Ottawa. They had to decide which one was going to go, and, and Ronnie was the one. He came here to Saskatchewan. Bob Shaw was the head coach at the time, and Lancaster and Shaw just did not get along. Eagle Keys came as a head coach in 1965, and he was such a down-to-earth guy that he and Ronnie hit it off right away. And uh, he let Ronnie run the offense pretty well. Uh, he was such a part of this community. Eagle was just such a wonderfully kind guy, and his wife, Joyce, um, was just a tremendous woman. And it would not be uncommon for Eagle Keys um, to go out to a sports dinner. He wasn't a great speaker behind the microphone, but, but you sit him down in the corner after and he'd start telling stories. Uh, he'd start playing the spoons. He, he could play the spoons, which nobody I know could master it the way he did. And the next thing you know, it would be 3, 4, 5, or 6 o'clock in the morning, and Eagle would say, well, we're going for breakfast. And so we'd all pile in his car and we would head over to his house. And he'd walk through the front door and he'd just announce, Joyce, we got company. And nobody was misbehaving. It was, it was just a fun night. Joyce would come down and there'd be bacon and eggs all over the place. And everybody would go home and sleep all day. Eagle would head into the office and uh, go through another day of work there. He was just able to make that sort of connection with people uh, and not just his players. Like the players loved him. They knew he was tough but he was able to sit down with the fans and, and, and give them his time. And when a head coach in this city does that, uh, he, he's, he is a god here. Growing up, I, I was George Reed a lot. I, was, uh, I thought I was going to be a running back, fullback you know, type thing, and I also enjoyed being a Ron Lancaster as well, because I thought I could throw the football, but uh, my first introduction to high school fo football was in Gull Lake under the great Jerry Elmsley, who uh, ran our football program there, and his first day at training camp uh, for high school football, first practice ever, basically, for myself, and we're sitting there at our first practice, and us farm boys are standing there wondering what position we're going to play, and... Uh, Coach Elms, he throws me the football, and I said, oh, good, I'm going to be a quarterback. He said, no, bend over. You're the center. Snap the ball to the quarterback. So <laughs> that's how my offensive line day started. I saw a statistic someplace. There was 15,000 people a year or something that leave Saskatchewan to live somewhere else. But once you're a Saskatchewan fan, football fan that never changes and you might you know cheer for Calgary or Edmonton or wherever you move to but uh, when it comes down to it and the green and white are in there your heart says Saskatchewan that never changes so they're all across the country if you go right across Canada uh, no matter where you go uh, there's a large following of Rough Rider fans although the guys have probably moved 5 10 15 25 30 years they're still Rough Rider fans, and when Rough Rider comes to town, they all show up. Uh, I know here in Calgary, uh, you know, on any given day, it could be 95 to 100 out, uh, degrees out, and you'll see people with star, uh, with toots and scarf, green scarves and everything else when the riders come to town. It just shows you how many, how many fans there, there were, although a lot of them moved away. In the 1950s, 1960s, um, the Rough Riders used to have a program where they would pick a player of the game, uh, player of the year, and the fans would vote on this. Well, during the 1960s, the, whoever was chosen the player of the year would be awarded a steer, a live steer. And this was because one of the rider executives or presidents uh, was in the cattle business, so he had these steers laying around. Anyway, one year, Huey Campbell was chosen the player of the year, and he won the steer. Well, over the course of that night's celebration, the steer was always awarded at a game at halftime. They'd trot the steer out, present it to the player, then he'd give it back to them, they'd take it back to the barn, where presumably they'd chop it up and 
give him some supper or something. But nevertheless, Huey got the steer, gave it back to him. Well, during the course of the night's celebrations, somebody decided to go get the steer. And they took the steer, and it ended up in somebody's backyard. And the people who had it decided they were going to hold it for ransom. And there was actually a pretty extensive search going on in Regina because it was getting to be a rather serious situation for some people to find this steer. And apparently, eventually, they found the steer in somebody's backyard, tied up. And of course, to this day, everybody denies uh, who took the steer. But I'm pretty sure it was Gordon Barber, who was a legendary old rough rider who played with him in the 30s and 40s, uh, who grabbed that steer and stuck it in somebody's backyard. Like everything in Saskatchewan, it's close. Taylor Field, uh, the fans are right on top of you. They're avid, they're loud, they're, uh, they're behind their Saskatchewan Rough Riders. It, it was a pleasure to play there. Now, I know visiting teams didn't like coming in there. I can remember Joe Cap and the BC Lions coming in there uh, when they were the, the power in the West, and it was always sold out. So they'd put people on the sidelines, and if a, uh, Saskatchewan Rough Riders say George Reed got pushed out of bounds, the fans would hold him up. If Joe Cap ran out of bounds, they'd put him on the ground, pound him a couple of times, and then shove him back on the field. And they, they took it very serious when teams come into Taylor Field. That is their backyard. And when you come into their backyard, they didn't want you there. Taylor Field was a nightmare. I mean, you had fans that, that were rabid, and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders were the team at that time. They were one of the teams in the Eastern Conference also with Ottawa and Montreal. But in Saskatchewan, you faced the mystique of Taylor Field. They beat the BC Lions at that time anyways on so many fourth quarter drives that used to drive us crazy. We'd beat them all day long. In the fourth quarter, they'd find a way to win. We'd fumble the ball, they'd drive 70 yards, or they'd kick that field goal or something. Something would happen at Taylor Field that they would win the game. Why and how, I don't know. And if I ever find out, I'll get the guy responsible. I can remember a story where one time in, in Taylor Field, they run a handoff. Ronnie runs a, hands a handoff here. Then it's, gonna, then it's a reverse coming around. And after Ron hands off, he's going to lead the reverse. I read it pretty quickly. So I get out on the edge, at, and I'm out. And the first thing I see is Ron Lancaster running at me and being that highly intellectual guy that I am, I have enough time to actually think that if I hit Ron Lancaster and kill him right here in Taylor Field, I will not get out of the stadium alive. So Ronnie comes and he starts to cut me down. He cuts, he grabs my ankles and tackles me down. He actually makes a pretty good block. But I'm actually thinking about, I can't hit Ron Lancaster. I mean, that's just not, doesn't happen. David Ridgway uh, is a very, very good friend and close friend of mine. And, and uh, as his holder, when I was when I was a, a rookie and, and in my first couple of years in Saskatchewan, when they said who wants to or who can hold for field goals, I put my hand up. But then again, I put my hand up if they said who can sweep the locker room. You know, I just wanted a chance to be on the team and be on the roster, and I would have done anything to do it. So I thought holding on field goals would be another way to keep me on the roster and maybe keep my job a couple more years if I had to. I felt of all the kickers that I ever worked with and, and all the kickers I've seen and, and got to know, Dave was as close to the real, a real football player <laughs> as they come. He wasn't exactly the most aggressive player, but he was, he's a tough guy. I mean, at one time on a, fake, on a fake field goal, he said to me, he said, Glenn, you roll out to your right. I got your backside. We were, <laughs> we were in Edmonton, as a matter of fact. He said, I got your backside. No one gets you from behind. Well, I rolled out to my right. I got nailed in the back. I got hit down into the turf. I had grass in my, in my mask and everything else. And I turned to Dave and he said, oh, they made great moves. And I watched the film and Larry Ruck and Willie Pless ran straight. And Dave made himself as skinny as possible as they blew by him on the backside to get me right in the back. So I'm not sure that he was the best, he was, you know, the best blocker as a kicker comes, but, but he, was a, he was a good football player.
my first year starting at guard, and we're playing in Calgary, and we're playing against, and I'm playing against John Helton. And John Helton, for some reason, switched over me, and that reason was because I was really bad and he was really good, so he was going to have a big day. And Ron Lancaster was our quarterback, and uh, probably about the second or third play of the game, uh, John Helton, like he beat me clean, I didn't even touch him. And I look back, and he's got a hold of Lancaster by the scruff of the neck and the britches of the pants, and he throws him about 10, 15 yards down the field, and I could see the the blood come out of Ronnie's arm from the turf burns and all this stuff, and um, I'm in trouble. Like, he hit our man, Ron Lancaster, and he hit him pretty good. And I go back and huddle, and Ronnie looks at me, and i am got, you know, got my eyes down because I'm like a whip pup, and... He called me a lot of names, and none of them are Roger. Yeah, I became the Undertaker. I think about I think it was 1971 in there someplace, and we had played Edmonton, and I'd had a a really physical year. I'd really hurt a lot of people that year. I don't know what it was. I'd hurt several quarterbacks throughout the league. And finally, against the Edmonton Eskimos, I'd hurt one of their quarterbacks the game before, and I'd Liverman, and I'd knocked out Wilkie, and knocked out Syme, and then back and knocked him out again. And and uh, that's Norm Kimmel tried to get me thrown out of the game, uh, out of the league. And that's when I became the Undertaker. And it was uh, I was fined, I was fined by Commissioner Jake Kadar a hundred dollars for excess excessive roughness throughout the game. I never got a penalty. Uh, but <laughs> now, I didn't say I shouldn't have got one. I said I didn't get one because, uh, in hindsight, uh, the uh, there's no question the tactics, the, the close lining and head slapping, and the clipping on the offensive side. The tactics in those days were were pretty brutal. Close lines, hitting quarterbacks high was not illegal. Bill put so many quarterbacks out of games that they put in a new rule <laughs> and uh, didn't let it happen. The close lane ended that year. <laughs> I think Eo Keys told me they call it the Baker rule. They said we're we're outlawing the close line, and uh, so that was the last year. I think that was the last year of the close line. Also, I think they uh, they eliminated the head slap because at that time uh, the head slap was a wonderful technique, which was too bad they got rid of that one because that was really fun. <laughs> One time in 1989, I was in a game that uh, the very last second, we were fighting for a playoff spot with the BC Lions. In the very last play of the game, Matt Dunnigan threw a Hail Mary pass to David Williams, and David Williams and I had been in a pretty much a fist fight for 60 minutes of that game, and I had another golden opportunity to put my helmet in the ear of David Williams as he stood there for this Hail Mary pass, and I got a pass interference call. Kept the drive alive. And Matt Dunnigan ended up moving down on another pass interference call and scoring the winning points on a quarterback sneak that put them ahead of us in the playoff race at that time. And now we were on the brink of losing our playoff position. Had a few games left in the regular season. So needless to say, I was public enemy number one in that province. And I had a listed phone number. Uh, I remember talking to John Gregory, who was our head coach, and saying, you know, I, I might as well face the music. I, I made a crucial mistake. You know, all I had to do was let him catch the ball and tackle him. Made a big mistake, and the fans are going to want to take a piece of me. And I got calls in the middle of the night and, and threats and, and <laughs> went on all the talk shows. And, and then I found out I got a letter from a, a, a mother in, in the game prior to, uh, prior to the game kicking off. I sat in the stands with a kid. He's probably about eight or nine years old. And we sat and talked. Uh, he, he did most of the talking, and, you know, I just sat and listened. And she wrote me this letter. I still have it today. And she said, uh, you know, she said, um, Glenn, you know, cost us the football game. And we all rode that emotion um, with his mistake. But he said, after it's all said and done, there's a kid that, that has a hero. And for me, that was, uh, that was a time when I thought, you know, I thought to myself, that's why I play the game. This is why I wanted to play as a kid. And it sort of refocused me, and, and that year we went on to win the Grey Cup.
The very first uh, game that I played in Saskatchewan, um, the, the coach at that time was Bob Shaw, and uh, he had the wisdom to put me at tight end. And I not only didn't have any practices, because I showed up late in the season, just get there and go to a game. Uh, I had never played in the in with all the big guys, you know, but in close. So I'd, I probably didn't have that good of a game. I remember that uh, during the game, I nothing ha I never was, no pass was thrown to me. And, uh, I, I, and my memory is that I did something on a punt cover and made a tackle, but uh, that could be, you know, after a lot of years, kind of shining it up a little bit. But I remember that uh, the next day at the film session, he asked me to stay after the film session. And the other players all knew that that meant I was getting cut. I didn't know that. And he called me in and said that he was going to release me. And I said, well, I don't know how I had the nerve to say this, but I said to him, Coach, if you release me without ever throwing me a pass, then you, you would be making a very large mistake because uh, George Reed told me that you guys need somebody that can catch a ball and you won't find anybody that could catch a ball better than I can. And uh, so my suggestion to you is you give me one more game, move me out to wide receiver, and cut me after I drop my first pass. And he did that, or otherwise I, you wouldn't be talking to me now. <laughs>In Saskatchewan, we were very fortunate. We had the Saskatoon Hilltops, and this is back when junior football was big. Now you had the Saskatchewan Hilltops, you had the, the Regina Rams, then you had all the other colleges. But a lot of the football talent back in the early 60s came from the junior football teams. I mean, if you just look at our football club in Saskatchewan, Ron Atchison played 18 years or 20 years, whatever it was, he was a Hilltop. Wayne Shaw played for the Saskatoon Hilltop. Ted Dashinsky, Saskatoon Hilltop. Uh, Wayne's brother Cliff Shaw played for the Saskatoon Hilltop. Hank Dorsch, uh, Don Benuke, Bill Baker. I mean, we had a ton of guys. Roger Alday, all played junior football. And you know what? They were all local kids that wanted to play in Saskatchewan from Swift Current, Saskatoon, you name it out there. They were from those small towns. They wanted to be Rough Riders. They wanted to play in Saskatchewan. And when they got the opportunity to play, I think they may have been a little bit low in ability at that time, but as soon as they put that green and white on in the province of Saskatchewan, their ability level, as much as their enthusiasm, it just came forward because that they loved playing in Saskatchewan because it was it's all they'd ever heard and they wanted to be part of it. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders have always paid attention to the rural roots and because football is so big here you'll find virtually every small town in this province has some kind of a football program whether it's three-man football, six-man, nine-man, it doesn't matter they all play it. Well back in the 1970s um, the Regina Rams which were an outstanding junior football team used to attract a fair amount of football players from small centers. And the, the two that I remember the most are Bob Poley, who came in here from Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan, which is north of Regina. It's a small little uh, community up there with not a big football program, but it, they have a football program. The other one was Barry Aldag, who came in from Gull Lake, and then his brother Roger, who followed him. There's a tremendous high school football program in Regina and in Saskatoon. Basically, every high school in those two cities and the smaller cities in Moose Jaw, Prince Albert, Yorkton, they play football. They play 12-man football, three-down football. Unlike some of the places in Vancouver and in, in Ontario, they play Canadian rules football. So it's part of it. You had kids coming in here from all over the province trying to make the Rams uh, or the Junior Hilltops up in Saskatoon because they knew that if they showed anything, it would be a ticket to the CFL. And there's nothing that the Saskatchewan Rough Riders wanted more or should want more is to have players from these small towns uh, get on their roster and, and uh, the ones who have made it it's done tremendous things for the riders out in rural Saskatchewan. Since 1948 the Saskatchewan Rough Riders have challenged for Grey Cup glory eight times.
At the 1966 Grey Cup, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders faced the Ottawa Rough Riders at Empire Stadium in Vancouver. The Green Riders had come of age. The little general, Ron Lancaster, was their quarterback, and the awesome power of running back George Reed gave the Rough Riders a lethal offensive attack. Ottawa also had a strong offense led by quarterback Russ Jackson, and it was the Eastern Riders that opened the scoring as Jackson connected with Whit Tucker for a 61-yard touchdown to give Ottawa the lead. The Saskatchewan defense contributed to their first major score of the game when a Dale West interception put the offense into scoring position. Two plays later, Lancaster faked a handoff to Reed and threw a touchdown pass to Jim Warden. Following another Ottawa turnover, Lancaster went long distance to Ed Buchanan. That put the ball on the 19. The series came to an end two plays later when Alan Ford caught a pass in the end zone for the second major score of the game. The 66 Grey Cup was a seesaw battle as Whit Tucker scored his second touchdown of the game. In the third quarter, a controversial pass interference called against Ottawa's Mike Blum helped Saskatchewan maintain possession and they would go on to dominate the third quarter. In the fourth quarter, Lancaster found the reliable Hugh Campbell in the end zone for a touchdown that turned out to be the game-winning points. George Reed's 31-yard touchdown sealed the victory as the Saskatchewan Rough Riders defeated Ottawa 29-14 for their first Grey Cup championship in franchise history. The 1989 Grey Cup featured the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and Hamilton Tiger Cats at the Sky Dome in Toronto. It was the Rough Riders' first Grey Cup appearance in 13 years at a time for glory. Inspired by their loyal fans, the Rough Riders were ready for battle. The early part of the first quarter was dominated by the Tiger Cats as kicker Paul Osbaldiston kicked two field goals to give Hamilton a 6-0 lead. Following a single point by the Rough Riders, Mike Kerrigan and the Tiger Cat offense would respond with a 65-yard drive that concluded with a Tony Champion touchdown. In the second quarter, the first Rough Rider major score of the game occurred when Kent Austin connected with Ray Elgard. Hamilton came right back as Kerrigan led the Tiger Cats to the Rough Rider 30-yard line, where he tossed a short pass to Derek McAdoo for another major. Austin was equal to the task, as he utilized the speed of Jeff Fairholm for a spectacular 76-yard touchdown. Hamilton charged back down the field as McAdoo went in for a one-yard plunge. The final touchdown of the half was scored by the Rough Riders as Kent Austin threw a touchdown pass to Don Narcisse. A Dave Ridgway convert made the score 27-22 in favor of the Tiger Cats at halftime. In the third quarter, both teams exchanged field goals before the Rough Riders narrowed the gap when a mishandled snap forced Osbaldiston to concede a safety. Two plays after the safety, a spectacular 52-yard play by Don Narcisse allowed the Rough Riders to move into scoring position. After a Hamilton pass interference call in the end zone, Tim McRae drove across the goal line to put Saskatchewan ahead. In the fourth quarter, two field goals by Dave Ridgway and won by Osbaldiston made the score 40-33 in favor of the Rough Riders. But with less than two minutes remaining, Hamilton quarterback Mike Kerrigan produced an impressive drive that ended with a Tony Champion touchdown. Overtime appeared to be on the horizon, but Rough Rider quarterback Kent Austin put an offensive drive together that took Saskatchewan down to the Hamilton 26-yard line. It was then up to all-star kicker Dave Ridgway to produce the game-winning points. Under immense pressure, Ridgway delivered as he sent the ball through the uprights to make the score 43-40 and give the Saskatchewan Rough Riders their first Grey Cup championship since 1966. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders continue their quest for glory as future generations strive to become Grey Cup champions.
Canadian football is a magic show. It is a game that has grabbed our nation by the heart. This is the story of CFL Traditions, a five-hour television special that showcases the history and heroes of Canadian football. Live the game's greatest moments through the eyes and hearts of its most celebrated legends. Now available on DVD and VHS, CFL Traditions is the ultimate collector's edition. Each of the nine franchises is featured in their own special team edition release. Nine teams, nine titles, available in stores everywhere. Canadian football it is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball, and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. In the Canadian League, uh, no such thing as being a rookie. You, you, you're a contributor or you're not or else you don't make it. The excitement in the game, in a Canadian football game, with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return, it may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I came up just with the attitude that I was going to learn about the CFL put my best foot forward. Whatever it took, I was going to get the job done, and anything else was not acceptable. I wanted to come play, and in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football, and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one. 